now we will get started. Um, again, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, again, I'm Cecily Cullen, the director and curator of the Center for Visual Art of Metropolitan State University of Denver. As the off-campus art center for MSU Denver, the Center for Visual Art acts as a resource for students in the broader community through contemporary exhibitions of local significance and global reach. Uh, we also have immersive education programs and workforce development for students interested in creative fields. So I'd like to extend my thanks to the amazing team here at CVA who make all of our programs possible. Um, the Center for Visual Art acknowledges the privilege we have to gather in this place, once the territories and homelands of so many indigenous people, including the Arapaho and Cheyenne nations, both of whom were subject to genocide and forcibly removed from this land. We acknowledge that the establishment of our campus further dismantled the culture, community, and tradition of this place through the displacement of Latina people who lived and worked in the Araria neighborhood. We respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land and value the knowledge systems they have developed in relationship to their lands. We collectively understand that offering a land acknowledgement neither absolves settler colonial privilege nor diminishes colonial structures of violence. Land acknowledgements must be accompanied with ongoing commitments to displaced indigenous and immigrant communities. In order to learn more about the spatial relationships of indigenous communities to lands, we recommend visiting native-land.ca. There are many ways to support indigenous people today, including through local organizations such as the Denver Indian Center and the Denver Indian Family Resource Center. The Banana Craze exhibition prevents some, pre presents excuse me, some of the food justice problems facing Latin America and the Caribbean today, but it also serves as a poignant reminder for us to think critically about our everyday actions. This exhibition demonstrates what happens locally rever reverberates on a global scale. Banana Craze brings to light the injustices to people and the planet when profits are prioritized over social justice. Through poetics, humor, and rigorous research, the artists in Banana Craze provoke dialogue about human rights, health, economics, and ecological concerns while inspiring us to question the status quo. I am delighted to introduce the curators of Banana Craze. Juanita Solano Roa is assistant professor in the Department of Art History at the Universidad de los Andes. Blanca Serrana Ortiz de Solorzano is project director at the Institute for Studies on Latin American Art. Both are specialists in modern and contemporary art from Latin America and have PhDs in art history from the Institute of Fine Arts, NYU. Juanita and Blanca are co-authors of the Digital Humanities Project, Banana Craze. This project has been reviewed in the international press, including El País in Spain, El Universal, Mexico, and Hyperallergic in the United States, and has obtained third place in the International Digital Humanities Award in 2021. Together, they have curated the exhibitions Banana Craze here at the Center for Visual Art and Bitter Bites, Tracing the Fruit Market in the Global South at Chuchi Frito's Gallery and Project Space in New York in 2017. Their research has published in the Museum of Modern Art's online journal, Post, Notes on, an art, on Art in a Global Context, and in the upcoming edited volumes, Nourish and Resist, Food and Feminisms in Contemporary Global Caribbean Art, New Haven, Yale University Press 2023, and Digital Humanities in Latin America, Bogota, Universidad de los Andes 2023. So with that, I welcome our two curators, and I just must say it's been such a pleasure to work with you, and I am thrilled to have you here today and can't wait to hear what you have to say. So welcome Juanita and Blanca. Thank you so much, Cecily, for the invitation to participate in, in this project. We have been having, we're delighted to have uh, worked with the whole team, even though we did this um, online. It has been a pleasure to meet everyone and we are really happy to be here sharing our project with you. So I'm going to share my screen now and 
Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, so since I cannot see you, I assume I can you can you can see my screen. So this is our project. Um, as Cecily said, this is a project Blanca and I co-curated together, and this began as a digital humanities project. So the presentation that we're going to give um, today has four points. First, I'm going to start telling you a little bit about bananas, why we decided to work on bananas, a little bit of its history. Then Blanca is going to show you um, the project, the online project that we have. And then Rochelle and Maria Jose are going to present their artworks. And finally, we're going to have a short conversation with them. And if anyone from the public wants to um, join the conversation, you're more than welcome to do so. So why bananas? Well, bananas are everywhere. Um, I just chose two um, examples where you can find bananas in popular culture. Uh, you're probably familiar with Maurizio Catalan's comedian piece from 2019 where he taped a banana on the wall in Art Basel, Miami, and this became um, this huge uh, attraction for many people at the art fair. People went there, took pictures with the banana. Um, the artist was kind of provoking the art system through such a simple gesture. It was sold for $150,000 and bananas became popular again in the art world through this particular piece. But um, in the early 20th century, uh, bananas became really popular through the figure of Carmen Miranda. She is a um, Brazilian actor and singer who became very popular in Hollywood during the 1940s and 50s. Um, some of her videos and movies were really, really popular among the, the public, especially in the US. And as you probably know, she used the trope of this exotic uh, Brazilian woman to sell her image. So I just wanted to show you a very, very short um, part of this video where she has, um, there's this banana set. You, you can watch the whole video online. It's really fun to see. Um, but bananas were not this popular by the end of the 19th century, and that's the story that I really want to tell you very quickly. So actually, bananas were practically unknown in the US, um, and they became this super popular food through um, the efforts of big banana companies such as the United Fruit Company, which was the first one to have plantations in uh, Latin American and the Caribbean. And this guy that I am showing you here, Minor Cooper Keith, um, he's one of the founders of the United Fruit Company. He was a businessman from New York who moved to Costa Rica to build the railroad. He was um, part of the family of this um, big uh, railroad um, builder, and he was in charge of joining the city of San Jose, the capital city of uh, Costa Rica, with the port of Puerto Limón. Of course, this was a really, really hard thing to do. Everything had to be done manually in the middle of the jungle. Um, I'm showing you here. Um, sorry, I, I'm going to jump. OK, no. I deleted that slide, sorry. Um, so he had to he had to work in the middle of the jungle with um, people from Costa Rica, but also people that were coming from different parts of the world. And they did this, as I said, manually. It was very hard and very difficult. And one thing that he noticed was that he could feed um, the workers with bananas. This plant grew. Uh, very easily in this environment and it was very nourishable, it was cheap. So he began to connect the dots and I, very quickly he realized that he could make 
of the banana, a very big business. He couldn't do this by himself. So he decided to join forces with uh, these two persons, Andrew Preston, who was the owner of the Boston Fruit Company in, in the United States. He had already um, a whole system for distributing fruits um, and with uh, Captain Lorenzo Dow Baker, who was um, shipping bananas from the Caribbean, from Jamaica to the US, small amounts, but he knew how um, to transport them. Um, because Minor Cooper Keith, he had, um, you know, the um, ability to grow the bananas in, 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 in Central America, but he had to uh, figure out how to take the bananas from Central America and the Caribbean to the US. So through um, this alliance, they formed what we know today as the United Fruit Company. I'm showing here you some one of the of the first logos that they had, which, um, you know, the gun right there in the middle speaks about the history of violences that will be uh, related to this company. Um, very quickly, they expanded throughout Central America, the north of South America and the Caribbean. Um, here I'm showing you two maps. This one is from the 1920s. This one is a little bit earlier, but you can see all the shipping lines that they had at this time. Um, they were not only transporting bananas, but also people. Um, they, you know, turned this into a tourism industry as well, bringing people from the U.S. to the Caribbean and then shipping bananas from the Caribbean to the U.S. Uh, we like to show these maps because they speak a little bit about this notion of manifest destiny. You can see it very clearly in the in the gestures of the hands of this man here and the woman um, on the top of this map. And and when we can start to see these imperial um, ideas that were behind such a big company. Um, why bananas? Bananas are attractive. Uh, because of their natural color. Anyone working in advertisement knows that black and yellow are very, very attractive colors and the bananas have them by themselves. Um, they're also very easy to transport because they have this protective peel. They are nutritious and of course they're very, very cheap. So that's why uh, bananas became such a food staple in the international business. Um, Banana consumption today um, is very, very high, is the, the, the fruit that we consume the most around the world. Um, to give you a couple of figures, in the US, um, the average person consumes 130 bananas um, per year. Um, that's a lot of bananas if you think that, you know, the US has more than 300 million people and that's only the US. You can see the figures for uh, Europe and Canada here yourselves. Um, we also like to show how this economy works because it's a it's an economy of scale. So this map is showing us the places where bananas are produced around the world. Of course, Southeast Asia is where um, most bananas are produced and this is followed by uh, Central and South America, as you can see here. What is really interesting is when you compare this map with the, the scale of consumption. So as you can see in Southeast Asia, um, the bananas that are um, produced here are mostly consumed locally, whereas in Latin America, the green dots become smaller and they begin to spread around the global north, meaning that um, Latin America is the biggest producer of export bananas in the world. Um, we have, we'd like to show this because it, it's very telling. Ecuador is the largest producer of bananas today, followed by the Philippines and then all the next um, countries that appear in, in this chart are Latin American countries, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Colombia, Panama, Honduras, Mexico. So it, it is definitely the center of banana production for the rest of the world. Now, um, there are some problems with this. 
and one of the most um, concerning problems has to do with um, the monoculture. What is a monoculture? It is. Uh, it means that only one variety of bananas are being planted, and this brings many issues because um, the plants can get um, sick, basically. So where whereas we have more than a thousand banana varieties, we began planting just one. And this makes the, the diseases um, spread very easy. Um, and that's exactly what happened with the first uh, variety of bananas that was uh, planted massively. That was the Gross Michael uh, variety of bananas. And you can probably um, think of the flavor of candies, uh, banana candies, th that flavor comes from this variety of bananas. And it, it is kind of strange to us today precisely because we are not familiar with this banana anymore. Actually, it was attacked by, by a disease called the Panama disease. And um, big companies began to um, plant a new uh, type of banana, that's the Cavendish variety. That's the one we consume today, the one we are familiar with. And the problem is that um, this um, variety is beginning to be attacked by Panama disease as well. Uh, so the impact of the monoculture in, in ecosystems is very, very high. Blanca is going to tell you a little bit more about that, and she's going to show you the project that um, we designed online. So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to give uh, Blanca the word. Thank you so, so much, Juanita. Thank you, Cecily, for the invitation, and everyone at the team at the CBA. Uh, um, our center at uh, MSU Denver. It's a pleasure to be part of this project and thank you again for the opportunity to uh, hold the exhibition there and also to be part of this public program. I'm going to share a screen and I'm going to very quickly for the sake of time because I think we're a bit, um, um, what's the word, like uh, we're not ahead of time. It's the opposite of that. <laughs> we are a bit delayed. And okay. I want to give the, behind, thank you. I want to give the artists enough, enough time to present their works because it's a wonderful and unique opportunity to listen to them. So I'll share a screen and I'll walk you very briefly through our Digital Humanities project. Please let me know if you can see my screen. Is it working? Yes. We awesome, can see. thank you. So as Juanita already mentioned, Banana Craze or La Fiebre del Banano in Spanish is a Digital Humanities project that is composed of a, an, a virtual exhibition a virtual archive and an online um, public program series. So as, a, as an online exhibition, um, one is created by a, a curatorial text at the beginning of the show, and then one may enter one of the three uh, galleries or uh, um, the exhibition rooms within the exhibition. These divide the works thematically, so there are works that belong to the category of violences, others that are under ecosystems, and others that are under identities. Just very briefly, um, the, the works by Latin American artists and Caribbean artists in this project that are under violences respond mostly to the uh, long-term effects of the presence of the United Food Company in Central America, mostly um, um, labor struggles, abuse of power, uh, their connections with the CIA in the toppling of governments, um, all of those uh, histories of violences, and the uh, works in the gallery of identities um, work with the stereotype of the Banana Republic and with the impersonation of this stereotype, sort of in the uh, figure of Carmen Miranda as Tiquita Banana, the UFC logo, as I'm sure you well, well known. And uh, most of the works in this section are works by migrant artists who are uh, based in the US, uh, but originate from Central America and the Caribbean, and they resort to the um, icon of the banana as a shared uh, identity that used to be pejorative, that is now, now ex uh, exhibited with pride, um, and defy um, stereotypes around the Latin American body as being hypersexual, lazy, uh, etc. But I'm going to focus on the section of ecosystems, as Juanita mentioned, uh, the, the works in this section 
relate to uh, the problems of the monoculture, which are many and include, but are not limited to uh, the not, di not diversification of the economy because um, agriculture is just centered in producing one produce instead of, instead of several, uh, the diet restrictions related to this, the waste of water that is um, tied to the banana plantations, and also, and perhaps most importantly, the um, use of pesticides, um, which lead to um, breathing conditions and um, uh, reproductive problems as well, and infertility. So, uh, as in any other section of the project, uh, you are also greeted by a, a text that explains this particular uh, theme within the exhibition, and then one may browse the works that uh, are under this section. So um, I, I, I don't think it makes sense to go through them because there are a selection of nine of these works is already at uh, Denver in the exhibition, and we're going to have two brilliant artists present their works today. But this is just to show you how the website and the exhibition is structured. So um, let's see if this loads. The exhibition might be browsed thematically. Here I'm going to show you like the mosaic of the 100 works that compose the exhibition. Um, each of them, as I just showed you, include one or several images, an artwork caption, and a description. Um, and here are the 100 works that compose the project. And we plan to add 50 more works next to spring uh, and upload this new bunch of, of projects uh, to the database. So one could browse the exhibition thematically, but one could also look at this corpus of works as a database, database or an archive, which can also be examined, uh, examined alphabetically uh, by artist last name, but can also be studied chronologically and geographically. The project starts with the iconic photograph by Raul Corrales that depicts um, Guerrilla fighters from the Cuban, Revolu Cuban Revolution celebrating the expropriation of the last uh, UFC plantation in Cuba. We thought it was an iconic moment to, to start this project uh, as this works defies uh, the presence of the UFC in the area. Uh, and also it's 1960, it's the beginning of conceptualisms and of leftist governments in Latin America. So it starts here and it goes through 2021. And uh, the beauty of this for us is that um, each individual visitor or user of the website may draw his or her own conclusions from looking at the chronology. For example, one could examine whether the works in the 70s and 80s uh, relate to dictatorships in Latin America in relation to the trope of the uh, Banana Republic, or whether in the 2010s younger artists are working uh, with preoccupations that are related to ecology and the environment. Similarly, by looking at the map feature, one can browse these works geographically and see, for example, if in Colombia, most of the works relate to the 1928 banana massacre that is famously um, cited or, or uh, recollected in uh, 100 Years of Solitude. And sorry, this is not loading for some reason, but one could should be able to see the works per country and uh, see differences and similarities between uh, uh, different nations. And finally, the, the project also includes a series of online events. We've hosted um, artist workshops, we've hosted scholars presenting on the topic, we've had artist conversations, we've had a couple of film screenings of documentary films that uh, feature banana plantations. And this is um, our way of making this project as open as possible, as transversal as possible, and as interactive as possible. Um, the website is, and all of the events are always accessible for free to anyone with an internet connection. And the idea is uh, to permit and promote nonlinear histories and studies of um, the presence of the banana in, in Latin America as seen through the spectrum and, and the culture of the visual arts. And we also, uh, regularly update our blog feature and publish academic articles under the publication section. And uh, we also collect all of the mentions to the project in the press, which are happily many. And we also 
update uh, our bibliography for any scholars who might be interested in the project. So this is Banana Craze. I hope that uh, you browse to their website when you've got time. I encourage you to follow us on Instagram. It's Banana Craze 2021 and to sign up for our newsletter. And it's it's been a pleasure to show you the project. I'm now going to uh, pass it on to Juanita again. Thank you. OK, thank you, Blanca. So now I'm going to present uh, Maria Jose Argencio. Maria Jose lives and works in Guayaquil in Ecuador. And having obtained a master's degree from Goldsmiths College, Argencio has since become one of the most distinctive voices within contemporary Latin American art. She was chosen as the official representative of Ecuador for the 9th and 13th editions of the Cuenca Biennial and the 10th edition of the Nicaragua Biennial and was selected by Vanguardia magazine as one of the, of the 12 most relevant women in the arts in Ecuador. She has had seven important solo exhibitions in her native Ecuador that have positioned her as one of the most relevant figures for a generation of Ecuadorian artists. Argencio has exhibited at the Center for Visual Arts in Denver right now, um, at the Centro Cultural Metropolitano in Quito, at the Museo de Zapopan in Guadalajara, at the Centro de Arte Contemporáneo in Quito, Espacio Cabo in Bogotá, the Amparo Museum in Puebla, MUAC in Mexico City, the Centro Cibeles in Madrid, and many, many, many other places that I'm not going to um, read. Um, her work is part of private and public collections in Saudi Arabia, Ecuador, Colombia, Spain, Singapore, Australia, Peru, and the US. And in 2013, she participated in the LARA program in Cusco and in 2015 in a residency program at the La Caja Blanca Gallery in Mallorca. So it's really a pleasure to have Maria Jose here. Um, she's going to tell us a little bit more about her artwork. Hi, hello, how are you doing? Um, thanks for everyone who is joining us today and uh, for Blanca and Juanita for making me part of this project, amazing project, um, and to the CBA people as well. Um, I'm going to start my presentation by asking Jen to play a um, commercial. It's called Banana Chiquita. It's from the 1970s. Uh, so Jen, if you can help me out with that, please. Jen, you're muted and we cannot hear the music of the video. Jen, you need to put your sound on, please. Oh, thank you. I'm to eat a banana and I've come to say bananas have to ripen in a certain way when they're flecked with brown and have a golden hue. Bananas taste the best and are the best for you. You can put them in a salad. Green? No, not yet, my dear. That greenish way you're looking means that you are ripe for cooking. How about me? No, no. When you are fully ripe, my dear, those little flecks of brown appear. Me? You're most digestible, my friend. Delicious, too, from end to end. <laughs> you can put them in a pie any way you want to eat them. It's impossible to beat them. But bananas like the climate of the very, very tropical equator. So you should never put bananas in the refrigerator. <laughs> Bananas are a solid food that doctors now include in baby's diet. And since they are so good for baby, I think we all should try it. See, 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 see. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you. So just please let me know if you can uh, see my screen. Yes, we can, Maria. Okay, so let me just uh, do a full screen mode. 
I cannot see myself, but as long as you can see my screen, it's all good. Yes, we're good. Okay, so I'm just gonna, um, we am participating in uh, Banana Craze in uh, the Center of Visual Arts with a piece uh, that the name of the pieces are the coordinates of uh, Machala. Machala is the capital of a province in Ecuador called El Oro, which means the gold, which is the capital banana of the world. As Juanita showed you on the presentation, we are the largest, most uh, uh, big and important exporter of bananas in the world. Um, but not just that, banana has become, like for everybody in South America, but especially in Ecuador, part of our identity as well. Like my work has to do with identity and um, all these sort of things that I'm gonna talk to you about. So I'm just gonna contextualize my piece and end up work talking to you about the piece that is on show that you, I hope, have seen already. And then this other piece that has to do with as well with the video that I uh, just show you right now. Um, so I, when I graduated, I did all my, um, I study in London, so I did all my academic career in London. Um, so it kind of, I, my, my work normally comes from my experience within being a Latin American, but it did change a lot when I did my MA at Goldsmith, that is a really political, a strong political theoretical um, university. I'm, I'm, I'm going to time myself. Sorry, I think I have time myself. Um, so I, um, so when I started Goldsmith, uh, there was this president, left-wing president, who came with a speech, an anti-imperialism speech. Uh, they came in power, Rafael Correa. He's a really controversial figure uh, in South America, in Ecuador uh, right now. Um, and he wrote this book, who is called Ecuador, the banana, from the banana republic to the no republic. So my work normally comes from putting myself on an Ecuador as an, I don't know, talking about the things that happen in here, but I think they do actually apply to all of South America. Um, so in this book, he normally talks, he talks about uh, uh, various, not just banana, but banana, cacao, prawns as well. I'm, I'm, I'm a daughter of a prawn farmer. Um, so it's like different moments in history and an industry that has um, that make us the country that we are, but not only identity wise, but as well, like economical wise as well. So like, you know, um, so it, this this it, it was a reference in this book as well. They, he talks about um, when we dollarize Ecuador now since 2000 uh, has the US dollar. Um, and so I take uh, all the things and put it in different uh, 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 investigation and put it in different uh, uh, words of mine. So I remember when he talks, for example, about the, do the dollar and the dollar dollarization, and this is the notion of novelism, which means that normally in South America and Ecuador, we normally think that everything that comes from outside is better than the one that the things that we produce and do and we suffer as well as an artist because normally people buy or spend a lot of money on art outside but they wouldn't spend the same amount of money on a south american artist so he just i just called this um i did this show after i graduated that i moved from Guayaquil to cuenca that is called just do it actually talking about this notion of novelism um and this complex that we have as south americans and we're always like thinking you know like you know the idea of the, the the American dream, America as as calling North America America, but America is actually all of us. But you know that, that this whole of notion of the uh, American dream, and I I presented three pieces as, as installations, and this is one of them. Uh, is the one that you saw first. That's why I'm showing it to you. And actually talks about our uh, when we got dollarized. So what we did is that what I did because um, he talks obviously he analyzes in this book about, you know, the economical, uh, Ecuador is one of the most expensive, expensive countries, I think, after Chile, of South America because of the dollar. Uh, so he talks uh, about the dollarization in the economical terms, but I'm more, for me, it was uh, the part that is uh, important for me is the fact that he says that this was, uh, you know, it, it was novelismo, you know, he was thinking that always like looking for like, something that came from outside was going to make our economy and our country better. Um, 
So what I did with this piece, this piece is called 25,000. And so I took 25,000 one sucre coins and I gold plated it. Uh, I normally work with uh, gold leaf a lot. It's a material that I uh, work with because it's one of the reasons why as well we got colonized, you know, the land, the gold. Um, so it kind of takes us as well to this notion and idea of uh, my work is anti, anti anti-colonialism, like, you know, criticize all these uh, um, ideas and way of being or way of thinking of people in Ecuador where, you know, we're still living like in colony times that, you know, brings issues with racism, uh, classism, you know, the division of classes. That's what it's important for me to talk about these moments in in history of Ecuador where, you know, the people, you know, El Pueblo got promised a better Ecuador got promised progress, but you know it was only the fewer people that got really rich. Uh, uh, for example, with oil and you know, so um, this piece is actually um, is because you know the generation seed and all these new generations haven't really seen Sucre. So it, this is in, within the young people. It's normally quite shocking for them to see this piece. Um, it talks about identity, but then as well talks about, you know, what it really means for us to not have, as a nation, uh, a, to use our own currency. Yeah. So then after that piece, I uh, did as well and worked in this piece that is called uh, 1729. It's actually the year where this, um, as you could see on the coin on the bottom, uh, it says 1929. We have, when Correa came in power, he used the word pelucon, which it means big winds. It's a term that can, comes from France. It's not a term that he invented it because people in the world think he invent, invented this term. The weaker the, your wing, the more uh, political power and money you had. So you show more, you know, uh, wealth yeah, and, 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 and power. So we did have a coin in our coin history, in our currency history called uh, Pelucona. This was the coin Pelucona. So I, what I did is like I recreated this win from, that is from Felipe V. Um, and I did it with wire, like uh, gold plated, I gold plated copper wire and I put in this uh, pedestal made of Guayacan. I normally use Guayacan because is a wood that represent us as an Ecuador, as Ecuadorians. It's like our national kind of more known wood kind of thing as we're talking about identity and stuff like that. And then I'm gonna come to you and talk to you about the piece that is uh, on the exhibition right now. Um, and as I told you, uh, the name is the coordinates of Machala. So I'm taking, because it's a site specific project. I normally work on a project basis, uh, site specific project basis. Uh, um, that's how it worked. So uh, what I did is that I went to Machala, which is the capital of capital banana of the world, and I gold plated it, uh, all this banana uh, on with gold leaf. And I took two images, which are the ones that you see on the show. Um, it's this one, which is an image that is being taken from a plane because at this time it was 2010, we didn't have a uh, drones. So it's that image is the, is this uh, tree is a tree from above. And this image for me is super important because it's, it actually shows wealth. Normally these uh, farms are like, like loads of acres, 500 acres, and it shows wealth, uh, which it makes me think about, you know, the division, again, the division of, uh, of the wealthness, of the money, you know, and how much money does the owner of the uh, land earns and how much money does the uh, people that actually works on this, uh, uh, in this, in this corpse uh, makes, right? So in Ecuador, we have a, the like minimum wage is $400, but um, what we call a, a basic basket, which is the minimum money that you need to have in order just to buy the basic food, nothing, you know, like not ham or something like that, it will be like, all like, will be like luxury for people, for the pueblo, it, you need $800. So it's like half of the money that you need to survive is the minimum wage. Normally these people earn this amount of money. Um, and how, you know, like the world is like, you know, how badly and, and it's spread. And as you know, we had had two major, in Ecuador, major protests uh, with Moreno and now with uh, Lasso. 
Uh, and, you know, it's b becoming a kind of a global phenomenon that people are actually asking for a um, claiming for a vida digna, which is a kind of respectable life. Like, you know, uh, so that this, this image as well makes me think about capitalism and how does this economical uh, form is not actually working. It has never worked, but actually people are actually, you know, demanding changes now because it's impossible to live with. Um, under this economical, like having a respectful life, living within this economical uh, system. Uh, so this piece as well for me brings another, you know, it's not not identity, the notion of novelism, but as well the notion of exoticism. Uh, I was displaced, I displaced myself, I moved from Ecuador to London to study. So I obviously started to see things on a different way and experience things in a different way. Things that I've already questioned when I was younger and it came kind of more clear to me. Uh, so, and, and for me, it was as well a really big experience to move to London uh, as an, a Latin American woman that I think about kind of like a cliche of a Latin American woman, you know, like the capes, lips, curly hair, brown, and stuff like that. And how do they actually see us as a kind of a, as, a, as a sexual object? Like, you know, like the video that we, uh, that I just showed you, it was a banana. Um, it was a banana that was a girl. She was like her, her, you know, you know, if you have, if you're a girl, obviously your chest were out, your breasts were out because she just had a jacket. And it was like this, like, you know, sexual kind of really, uh, that was my time, sexual kind of, uh, um, but, uh, you know, with this like really colorful uh, dress then that will take me to the to this piece, Chiquita. I call it Chiquita because of that video, like relating it to this video, to this like traditional dress that is really colorful. And when she arrived on a boat, uh, with these really like big eyelashes on a boat uh, to um, to the first world, all the first world people were boys. They were all in suits, and there was a kid, and the kid was as well a kid, a boy, you know. And she was like really playful, and she was flirty. She was this sexual object moving within these uh, male nom nominated men. You know, the men in 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 the first world was just the world in in the uh, in the first the world in the the first world world was just, you know, full up with men. Um, and we were this kind of like, you know, sexual object that will come around and explain to them how to eat a banana. You know, like you can put it in a pie, but you're not right. And you cannot put it in the refrigerator. Um, so it's just kind of become, you know, brings in this notion of exoticism as well. Um, how they actually see us as this, um, yeah, sexual kind of uh, a, exotic object. And I'm going to finish there because my time is gone and passed. So I'm going to stop the share screen. Thank you so, so much, Maria Jose. That was fascinating. Um, I'm now going to introduce Rachel. Um, it's lovely to have you here, Rachel. Thank you so much for joining. And we've been in touch before, but it's also lovely to finally see you and be in conversation with you. Blanca, uh, so Rachel, to interrupt you, Maria Jose, we're still seeing your screen. Okay, now we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Juanita. So Rachel Motman Solano uh, grew up in New York City and works between New York and Panama. Starting often from her biography and family history, Mothman explores how the intersection of history, identity, and positions of power form individual and collective experience. Her work is concerned with the convergence of ideology, mythology, economics, and the psych through photographs and film that explore narrative as inherent to humanity and shaped by perception. Mothman's art is deeply informed by her clinical work in psychoanalysis. In 2022, Mothman was awarded the Colleen Brown Art Prize. In 2021, Mothman had a solo exhibition of her film, All, Thing, All These Things I, Can, I Carry With Me, at South Bend Museum. In 2020, Mothman released her monograph, Colonial Echo, with, with Chris Graves Project. And in 2019, Mothman had a solo exhibition, Metamorph Metamorphosis of Failure at SMAC. And the same year, she was awarded the NYSCA NYFA Artist Fellowship. Mothman has been awarded a New York City Film and Media Grant, Your Own Foundation Fellowship, and she has held res residencies at LMCC Workspace, Smack Mellon, The Camera Club of New York, and Lightwork. Her work has been published in 
the light work annual contact sheet, presumed innocence, exit magazine, and many others. So thank you so much for being here with us, Rachel. Uh, it's all yours. Okay, thank you so much. I, um, I'm so, I'm really honored and and happy to meet you all uh, in person, sort of virtually, <laughs> finally, and really happy to uh, meet Maria Jose. That was really fascinating. I'm always really happy to see other artists talk about their work. So I, because of my own inability, I guess, to share my own screen, I'm going to rely on Jen, who's been kind enough to offer to share her screen of my presentation. I just, I uh, collected a few images that I wanted to show just in my research process, and then I'll show m probably most of the film, or I might ask Jen to cut it to about half. Um, so the film that I made called The Dying Cavendish, I sort of conceptualized around 2016, and it had to be this converge, it was kind of connected to a convergence of the election and the winning of the election in the US of Donald Trump with my interest in the history of Manifest Destiny and my interest in the history of US policy in specifically in Panama. And what began to happen was just a lot of reading and understanding of how the United Fruit Company came to exist, how it was essentially stealing land, tricking uh, native people in Costa Rica and Panama to basically um, really steal their land and in the process murdering a lot of people. And one of the other things that I was really interested in was the history of the um, Gross Michel banana, which was the banana that Juanita was explaining was the one consumed in the 1950s and then eventually died of Panama disease. Even that expression, Panama disease, was very fascinating to me. So, Jen, if you could just show the next image, because um, it's just part of the research I was doing, which is the way that um, United Fruit began, began really teaching the US public how to eat bananas. And this image, and maybe the next one, I can't remember <laughs> how I sequenced them. Um, well, this is sort of um, an image that I kind of used as inspiration for the film, but um, there's a lot of images that I was going through in magazines and cookbooks that United Fruit was publishing to teach the US public how to, how to eat bananas and really, um, not just how to eat them, but you know, to really make them like a like a like a daily part of the U.S. consumption. And part of the way they did this was through films like *The Gang Is All Here*, which Juanita showed an excerpt of, which shows Carmen Miranda. And I used that film kind of as a basis to talk about um, American policy. You know, uh, Panama and Central America were known as Middle America at some point, and through film, Hollywood film, um, because the, the 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 owners of Banana uh, United Fruit, um, you know, post Minor Keith, who founded it, were family and relations to people who were sitting in Congress and really in positions of power, and also had big um, connections to Hollywood film production. So this was all sort of like a like a, a um, you know like an ecosystem of power. Um, to to create profit. Um, so the banana as a sort of metaphor began to interest me too in terms of the racism that I saw coming up with the election of Donald Trump and the Build the Wall campaign um, and the irony and the contradiction of that based on the 120 years policy of the US connected very much to United Fruit. Um, of using basically Central America and the rest of Latin America to, to you know, to exploit them of resources. Um, but then to sort of sell this sort of um, um, a, a kind of um, a racism based on, on sort of the preservation of whiteness. And I thought it was really interesting to think about the fact that the bananas that are cultivated are sexless fruit that cannot be planted based on seeds. So basically, and you could you could keep going, Jen, with... <laughs> okay, so this is just a, a picture I made that was kind of like a, a photograph that I tend to work in photographic stills to either influence the films I'll make, or I might make the film first, and then that will influence sort of how I'm making the, the still photograph. 
Um, but I was really interested in the the um, fantasy of presenting Minor Keith as a dying Cavendish banana, dying from Pan Panama disease, because it's said that Panama disease, which is reoccurring and is soon to kill the Cavendish, is coming from Australia. It's going to kill off the Cavendish. So there's all these connections between a sexless fruit that is... Um, that is that is really not based on diversity <laughs> and the sort of uh, fantasy that I had about how diversity is really the thing that that strengthens us biologically and how this kind of racist ideology around purity and racial purity is really the thing that's killing minor Keith. So it's sort of like this fantasy on that. So we could play some of the film now. Just a moment. Thank you. I think it's also muted. Okay, I have my sound on. Can you hear me? I do hear you. Okay. Okay, let me try one thing here. Okay. Hear it yeah, I just got a, a little taste of the music. But if if you hear it, it's very low on my end. We had no idea what we were seeing. We couldn't see the details, make out the vast nuances or value the differences of the endless jungle. The Panama disease used to kill everything. The only solution was to get a hold of new land. So when one farm died off, another was planted. One would die, another was planted. One would die, another was planted. When you see the narrowing genetic culture, that's when you know things are going to die. UFC You're a superior, are we? Well, unfortunately, Sweat. it's very laggy. So maybe, Jen, if we could fast then, the part where there's more dialogue. Um, essentially, I had this music made for me by a friend who... Um, you know, we we listened a lot to the gang is all here and other films that were made um, sponsored and funded by United Fruit through Hollywood um, in the 1940s and kind of based our soundtrack around that. Um, but there's a part if you move a little bit ahead that is um, more dialogue and so it might be less laggy. And, and also using a lot of sort of the tropes in the gang is all here, you know, like giant bananas. Um, so we could start here and, and, and maybe at the end of this scene, we can stop since it's pretty much the end of our time. Banana, por que te ves así? Enfermo. It's Panama disease. I invite you to sit with me, but I may not get up. Como te pasó? Jeans. We Cavendish are homogeneous. Who knew homogeneity would be our death? So just to kind of, because the sound is so bad, I'll just explain a little bit that I was really interested in the people that had 
were brought to Panama to labor in the banana plantations. And a lot of the a lot of those people were people from Asia, China, um, Jamaica, the, the West Indies, uh, all over um, to to begin to grow bananas. Um, and I was interested in in their bodies, you know, being used and and this idea of um, you know the 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 body as as a kind of um, you know like a resource um, for united fruit and 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 then and then sort of the way that their bodies were being affected by the policy that uh, united fruit was helping to create through U.S. policy U.S. government policy in the region of Central America specific to Panama but also other areas uh, Costa Rica Colombia in in the region. Um, so it, to me, this felt like an intersection of mythologies and stories that were intersecting um, to talk about this history um, uh, that was very much based on on racist ideology formed around manifest destiny and this, uh, you know, this settler mentality. So I'll end now because I feel like I've gone over time. Thank you, Rachel. This is um really really interesting and i think many of the things we have talked about come um materialized in your in your work in so many ways um we wanted to begin this conversation by um asking maria jose one question and it has to do with the large scale of um of your pieces like it's hard to see in the presentation and it's hard to see here online, but um, I was wondering if you can speak a little bit more about the installation, why you decide to protect these images, how does this scale play a very important role in the experience of the, of the ex ex spectator of your piece? Yeah, I normally, I normally work with objects like I normally do sculptures and installation. I am one of the few artists um, that has done installation, like my career is mainly that. I'm very interested in, in, um, in, in the space and what does the space does with people, like how do you behave in dif different spaces, like if you're in church or, I don't know, you're at your mom's or, I don't know, no, you're in a social event and how these spaces as well, like how do you, you know, like influence your behavior. So normally I work, um, my museographies are like, for me, are like another piece of work. Like I normally, so for like the, the, the you know, like the experience that the expectator is going to have with the piece is super important for me. Um, and it was really important. I remember I asked for a bigger room and we didn't have it. So for me, it was really important that the scale of the piece, especially because it's actually the first time that the piece is shown outside, like, you know, a, I wouldn't say like Ecuador is divided in coast, uh, highlands, and the Amazonie. I wouldn't say like people from, uh, you know, like everybody in the coast. I think mainly they have gone to a, like a farm, like a banana farm. But it's uh, these trees are like five five meters tall, six meters tall. So it's they're like so. I wanted to kind of have the people to have that kind of sense of how big these trees are and to be like within the space um and it was really for me it was a bit kind of how i'm gonna because you know like I, you go and you do the thingy you but the thing is not actually the piece that is there so how do you put that into a gallery space um and i had few images and what images were going to work um so i decided to have these two you know like you know obviously the tree the, the image of the tree where you can see it in front of you but on a scale where people are we're gonna get a sense of how big uh, this space is because, and then you have the other one where you actually see one, t you know, like it's, it's almost a dot within just a little bit of a space of these acres of acres of acres of land of these um, farms, you know, that makes me think about wealth and how this wealth is distributed, unfairly distributed, and all the things that I've already talked about in my presentation. Thank you so much. So uh, I think we're running out of time. So I'm going to ask Rashad one question and then perhaps we can open it to the public so that uh, the audience here with uh, with us today can also um, enjoy the conversation with the artists themselves. So Rachel, I'm 
I, I love your video piece and I'm uh, very curious about the role of gender in the video. Um, I feel like um, despite perhaps um, one, what one would expect about uh, migrant workers being subjected to um, um, the, the way of the company of the UFC on them, they seem to be able to defend themselves. Like uh, the one who tries to to embrace minor Keith, um, embraces with him, but it doesn't really happen. And then she says like, I don't want to emphasize, empa what's what like empa emphasize? <laughs> like there's no empathy basically. Like she doesn't want to feel his feelings, right? And then there's the three, the three women who are like um, dancing and and uh, carrying the weight of um, of a burden, but also like I, I guess like getting stronger by doing that and by doing it together. So I'd love to to hear more about uh, your perspective on on gender in this film. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I I, I completely agree that there's a. Um, the, a way in which I was very, I, I was very interested in the women and particularly because in the, the research I was doing of the history of taking land, a lot of the victims of the land that was being stolen were women, you know, indigenous women were being killed and, um, and also women as laborers and, and the impact of that on their lives. And I think that, you know, when I was working in that piece, I was really thinking about a woman that I actually knew in Panama, who um, was a woman who had cared for my mother's cousin. And she died just a terrible death. Um, and I won't go into the details of it, but it, what I mean when I say terrible death, I mean just very alone, really abandoned. Um, she had spent her whole life caring for others. And at the end of her life, nobody was there for to care for her. Um, and her body was really used uh, in her life. So I was kind of tapping into the spirit of her and and using um, what I witnessed, uh, you know, because we visited her toward the end of her life in 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 her abandonment um, to portray in the characters of the woman in the film. I was really interested in that um, tapping into her biography. Um, to talk about, you know, the, the way that women's bodies get used and they're not uh, being compensated. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you. We can open now these two questions from the public. You can just open your mics or or just write the question on the chat and we can read it. Or Rochelle or Maria Jose. Sure. In the meantime, um, Maria Jose, can you tell us a little bit about your experience of gold plating a banana plant? Um, how was that? Like, did you bring someone who specializes in this? Like, how did you get the permission to do this? How was this? Where did you get the gold from? Like, can can you tell us a little bit more about that process? Well, I'm, I'm from the coast, so Bachala is on the coast of the uh, uh, of Ecuador, and my family are far, like farm farmers, and they have had as well banana plantings themselves. So I have friends, families that owns banana plantains. So I just, but you know, like ask permission to one of them to like just let me, you know, like do this. Uh, please on the on his on his you know he was gonna lose one plant out of these uh, you know acres of acres plants um and then this was actually my first installation that i worked with a uh, gold plate from then i uh gold leaves and then i i had a uh, few more pieces that i have worked with that material um we have a region in Ecuador that is called san antonio de ibarra which is normally and traditionally known for carbon wood and gold plating, uh, is you know is, is something that we got you know like indigenous native people got taught in at colonial times, and they after they took kind of over, it just kind of became our thing as well. Um, so uh, I just I just went there and I just talked to people and. Uh, so I just I, I normally work with collaborations. This is really important in my work because I, I don't produce my work myself. I collaborated with indigenous native people 
Um, and they're, you know, like craft that are kind of part of our identity as well, like gold plating now or wood carved um, as well, like within. Um, so I collaborated with uh, this community called, uh, that is in San Antonio Ibarra, and I just, we just moved there and we had to make this bamboo, um, I forgot the names of the things that you, you know, like a frame. Um, like a scaffolding, right? Yes, exactly. Like scaffolding around it. And we had to move really quickly because uh, weather in South America are like, you know, it, when it rains, it just, you know, the rains will be on your waist, you know, like, so we had to move really quickly because of the insects and the weather. And so it was quite challenging, but I'm always up for a challenge. <laughs> Um, we have here one question from Shayna Rising. She says, hello, and thank you for your terrific presentations. I'm curious, do audiences in the US respond differently to your work than audiences in Latin America? For instance, I am a professor and I teach my students about the history of US intervention in Latin America with the banana industry, and my students are shocked. They were not aware um, of the banana wars. So do you find that some audiences are more familiar or ready to confront these histories than others? Hi, Shanna. Oh, hi, Shanna. <laughs> I, you have a different last name on the, sh on the chat, so we thought you were somewhere. Shanna somewhere. Singh is a wonderful um, scholar and author of an award, uh, award book on, on food and art. Um, I'm going to paste the link here. I don't know if any of you want to answer. Rochelle? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I, I think that it's, it is surprising for, because um, I've presented the, this video um, more to students when I get invited to talk to um, photography, you know, classes and students here in, in the US have absolutely no knowledge of United Fruits history, its relationship to US policy in Latin America. There's really no awareness. Whereas in, when I showed this piece in Panama, I did it with Lara actually, um, there is an awareness and there's real interest and there's real understanding um, in a very different way. So I, I think that the, you know, I think that this is why also I'm so interested in, you know, in some ways, um, you know, so much of my work is is based on history and sort of talking and mining the history of U.S. and and sort of Central American relations and connectivity. And I, I guess part of this is my my desire that everyone in this in the U.S. where I live know about it, <laughs> because I feel like it's part of it's our history. It's, it's a collective history. You know. I I I think they they. See, yeah, they perceive it differently. They obviously, as as you mentioned your on your comment, they are not aware of things. And you know, like history itself, when you kind of talked about how they perceive it, I just you know, I know that right now in in the U.S. there you know these there are these conversation argument about how you know your own history is being taught and how like Native Afro Americans are like saying we need to say the truth and. You know, this is the truth, so we have to say it like this. And I do kind of get when I move to, I live all my life in Ecuador. So when I move to um, the UK, the UK as well is an island. So I just kind of have this idea, um, my idea, my perception, where it, when you're on an island, they don't, for example, speak another language in the UK. You know, they all speak English, they all expect everybody to speak English, but they are not aware of you know, anywhere that happens outside is is just really is crazy. Is crazy. So, I'm still mm -hmm. in a chat with my friends from Goldsmith, my closest friends, and you know, I just kind of go like, oh, you know, but you know, this this happened. You know, this this crisis that we have right now in jails is is in Al Jazeera. So, are you not? You know, like, you have a friend from Ecuador, so <laughs> you should like at least be aware of this. What's happening right now? It affects me. So. I do think it's, it's definitely different. As I said, this piece is the first time, I mean, it's not the first time that I exhibit outside, but this piece is the first time that I show it outside. And it was uh, it was actually quite shocking because the CVA as well has a lot of uh, students that they're, they're from the States, but their parents are 
um, from Mexico or, you know, it was actually for me really shocking to find people from Mexico that her parents, like her parents are, from, their parents are from Mexico, but they wouldn't speak Spanish or um, that they are really like not aware of, and like they wouldn't, they haven't even visited, you know, like it's just really painful. Um, so I, yes, I do have to kind of go into more detail and explain to them because they are not aware. I do kind of feel like it's a kind of more of a first world thing where, you know, like the history of art is taught within a, you know, European self center. You know, this is what happened in London, this is what's happened in Paris, but they're not talking about, you know, this is what happened in South America or this is what's happened in Asia. So I, I just kind of Thank feel you, like. Thank you, Maria. Sorry, I think we need to wrap up. I feel like some of our guests are already leaving. I'm going to close with uh, some great remark from Catherine Taft. Thank you so much for your comment on the chat. She says, I have found that while giving tours at the CBA, our audiences have no knowledge at all about the banana industry, and the exhibition has opened a lot of eyes to learn from your work. So uh, thank you so, so much, and thank you everyone uh, for attending the event today, and thank you, Cecily, for inviting us to create the exhibition, and thank you so much, Rachel and Maria Jose, for being here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, and all the guests.